So today we continue with our discussion on the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita and here we will focus on the concept of yoga. So a quick recap we are discussing the key concepts of the Bhagavad Gita and till now we have focused on going progressively addressing issues like our identity, how that understanding of our identity affects our relationships, affects our vision of our work, we understood destiny, karma and especially in the sixth chapter in the previous session I talked about the mind and how the mind is like an inner screen inside us. So functionally it is essential for us so that we can we souls can link with the body a eh? it's like the software that links the hardware of the body with the user the soul but then the mind is also like a driver who a person sitting next to the driver who distracts the driver and we discussed how we can learn to focus the mind through persistence intelligence and transcendence. So today I will talk about the <coughs> topic of yoga and what is yoga, how can it improve uh, my physical, mental and spiritual health. Can you go ahead? So we will discuss three things. What is yoga, what is its purpose and how can we best approach yoga. Yeah. So we will take, take this based on the 6th chapter, 11th verse primarily, 11th and 12th. Shuchav deshe pratishthapya sthiramasanam atmanaha natyav chritam natinicham chailajin kushottaram tatrai kagram manaha kritva yata chittendriya kriya upavishyasane yunjad yogam atma vishuddhaye so This is describing the starting stages of the process of yoga Shuchav Deshe Go to a secluded sacred place Clean place Pratishthapya Become situated in that place Sthiram Asanam Atmanaha And find a steady place to sit Asanam Natyo Chiritam Nati Necham Let that space be neither too uh, high nor too low Chaila Jinakushottaram Sit on a uh, mat of kusha grass uh, Sit on uh, uh, kusha, kusha grass with covered deer skin The kusha grass can be pointing Uttaram In the northern direction Tatraika Grahamana Krutva Then Eka Grahamana Make the mind focused Krutva Yat Chittendriya Kriya and learn to restrain the consciousness, the senses and the actions. Upavishya sane yunjat and being the situated engage yunjat yogam in the practice of yoga. For what purpose? Atma vishuddhaye. So the purpose of yoga is described to be self purification. Atma vishuddhaye. Vishuddha is, pu shuddha is purification, vishuddha is a total. Thorough purification. So this verse is describing uh, the process and the purpose of yoga. The process is <coughs> seclusion and concentration, seclusion and uh, physical postures for inner concentration uh, for ultimately to get purified. So let's look at this a little bit more. <coughs> Move forward. Generally, as soon as we hear the word yoga nowadays, the first thought that comes in our mind is about postures. That yoga is equated with yoga asanas. Now, that is not a, is that a valid equalization? Yes, it is, but it is not a, uh, it is not a complete equalization. Postures or asanas are actually just one limb of one type of yoga uh, one limb of one type please go ahead so broadly speaking in the spiritual tradition of India yoga has been classified into four categories 
now the nomenclature can sometimes vary the so stress can vary but the concept is that there are these are four yogas karma jnana dhyana and bhakti if we consider that we all have different faculties karma is action so we could if the word yoga itself means connection so karma yoga can be called as the action connection jnana yoga the knowledge connection dhyana yoga the meditation connection and bhakti yoga the devotion connection so in each of these yogas the stress is on a particular aspect of our being through which the connection is established now other aspects are also involved but not primarily in karma yoga it is through physical action we work in a mood of detachment and dutifulness and thereby establish our connection with higher spiritual reality in jnana yoga we primarily focus on using our intelligence to establish that connection so through intellectual analysis we, uh, the yogic seekers focus on okay this is temporary therefore this can't be real that is also temporary that is also temporary so it's in sanskrit called the process of naiti na iti not this not this not this so in this way by rejecting everything that is temporary and non enduring they come to the level of understanding what it is that is eternal so that is jnana yoga now beyond jnana yoga so jnana yoga primarily involves using the faculty of the intelligence to dwell on who we are uh, to dwell on realizing who we are and then dhyana yoga is the title of this current chapter of the bhagavad gita the sixth chapter dhyana is meditation so here the essence is all the mind uh, we think with our mind we meditate also when we learn to focus our mind so this chapter the previous verse we discussed was about mind and mindfulness and krishna stresses explicitly about how the mind can be a both an enemy or and a friend depending on whether it is controlled or not so the yoga which involves steady focus of the mind till one comes to this level of dhyana and then there is bhakti yoga so bhakti yoga is the is connection through devotion here we try to activate the emotion of the heart and elevate it direct it spiritually direct it toward bhagwan the supreme spiritual reality so so we could say the uh, it is the heart connection or the emo, the devotion connection now why are these four types of yogas relevant right now we were discussing about asanas and uh, how they are one one limb of one type of yoga so we discussed four limbs four types of yoga now let's move to the next slide so the asanas are actually one limb of dhyana yoga the word dhyana yoga also has another name which is ashtanga yoga because the ashtanga it has eight limbs and those eight limbs are mentioned here yam niyam uh, yam is yam and niyam are basically prescriptions and proscriptions now what are the things to do and what are the things to not do it's just like a if we are following a doctor doctor's uh, directions to heal ourselves or to strengthen ourselves then the doctor may give us a list of do's and a list of don'ts so yam and niyam are like that then these are these are broad ethical guidelines of how one should live and how one should not live and then asan from asan onward specific practices start so asan is sitting in a particular bodily posture then pranayam is the process of uh, breath control regulating our breath so that we can go, we can grow so that we can calm ourselves and our consciousness can gradually steady and focus our breath is quite strongly related with our mind when we are agitated we start breathing faster 
so by con becoming conscious of our breath and slowing our breath we can calm ourselves so asan is physical pranayam is more of uh, focusing on the uh, breath so prana is often translated as life life air by breathing we our life by breathing and the circulation of air our life is maintained so prana is the life air it is it is considered to be not just oxygen but it is uh, a holistic system of uh, of the life air in the body which enables us to sustain ourselves and there is pratyahar pratyahar is ahar is food pratyah is against so we often equate food with what we eat however all our senses are hungry for their particular objects our eyes uh, our eyes crave for attractive forms our ears crave for melodious sounds our nose craves for for fragrant objects so pratyahar involves that we don't feed any of our senses so it's not saying not feed the body yes we have to take food in a regulated way but we don't feed our senses so feeding our senses means pandering to their cravings so we can feed our body in that in this sense of regulation we can feed our body without feeding our tongue so feeding our tongue would mean that we pander to its craving for eating too sumptuously or, or too opulently um, often too unhealthily so we eat regulatedly so the idea is we want to take our consciousness inward and therefore we we avoid exposing ourselves to any of the things that would attract and drag our consciousness outward if there are tempting objects in the outer world then it's difficult to focus on the inner world so just avoid exposure to tempting objects shut off tempting objects this can be done by closing our eyes or half closing our eyes if we close our eyes one might just fall asleep but if we half close our eyes then we don't look outward and we don't doze off completely also so usually yam niyam are general rules of lifestyle what the bhagavad gita's 11th verse in the 6th chapter said is asana shucha udeshe pratishthapya sthiram asana matmana ha so this is generally done in a secluded place the yogis leave, usually leave the world those are serious yogis they leave the world and after announcing the world they go to a forest and there they sit down for meditation and then gradually as the senses are starved of external objects they slowly slowly stop agitating us and then we start going inward so then there are progressive stages of inner contemplation dharan is the stage where we are entering into meditation uh, our mind becomes steadily focused dhyana is where we go deeper and we become absorbed in meditation and samadhi is where we are lost in meditation so we start starting in meditation situation in meditation and it's complete transportation in meditation so dharan dhyana and samadhi we, at one level we could say they are progressively deeper stages uh, deeper levels of the process of inner contemplation samadhi is the stage where one is lost in trance and this is where one can have uh, spiritual visions spiritual experiences of realities beyond the material we'll be discussing about samadhi in a future verse in this chapter itself but the point of discussing these eight limbs is twofold primarily it is to stress that asanas cannot be equated with yoga we the compound word is you use yoga asanas so among in the process of yoga the limb of asanas so asanas are just one one limb of one type of yoga and the other point for uh, stress or explaining these eight limbs is that 
for each one of us uh, the if we can see that especially the all the later stages involve the mind and focusing the mind so to the extent we focus the mind to that extent we progress deeper and deeper in meditation so uh, dhyana yoga is centered on the mind especially as we see by the last three stages so let's move ahead now so we discussed what is yoga yoga essentially means connection or harmony so when we are connected then we are in harmony when we are disconnected we are in a state of disharmony so what is this connection being talked about uh, the connection between finite consciousness that is we ourselves and infinite consciousness in the practice of yoga what is the ultimate reality that may or may not be known but there is some understanding that there is some reality beyond the physical beyond the material and whatever is that reality one is striving to establish a connection with them. so the yogis may begin their meditation by focusing on some external object such as they may start with the tip of the nose <coughs> the nasika gram swam dishascha navalokayan this is just described in the next verses 6 chapter 13 14 15 verses nasika gram swam it the tip of the nose they fix on or bruvor madhye they focus on the space between the eyebrows uh, but those are just external points for a uh, focus so that the consciousness starts going inward the ultimate purpose is to focus on the divine within the heart on the form of as he is called vishnu vishnu specifically called Vish, vishwa and anu vishwa is universe anu is atom so one who is in every atom of the universe one who is all pervading and who is therefore present per, uh, and pervading in my heart also that indwelling divine i want to meditate on i want to focus on so yoga is the process of establishing harmony between the finite consciousness and infinite consciousness and so asanas are one preliminary part of one limb of yoga go ahead so now what is its purpose what is yoga meant for i discussed in that verse atma vishuddhaye for purification so why as the word yoga means connection and in the 6 12 verse it was said yogam atma vishuddhaye for the purpose of purification so what happens we have impurities within us which which drag and distract our consciousness and yoga by purification helps our consciousness to become spiritually connected and spiritually situated and ultimately what happens can you go ahead we realize ourselves it is we understand who we are self realization is the purpose of yoga to to gain an understanding and a realization of who we are the pri primary texts for understanding yoga are the patanjali yoga sutra and the bhagavad gita the patanjali yoga sutra gives a uh, definition of yoga as yoga chitta vritti nirodha so yoga is what chitta is the movement of con is consciousness embodied in the material level consciousness manifested at the material level so consciousness vritti the the, the, so the movement of the consciousness in the material world at material level nirodha it is it pauses it ceases so i'll mention this briefly and in the verses about spiritual experiences 620 onwards 6 chapter 20th verse we should be discussing in future sessions then we'll talk more about it but just a brief recap in our previous session we discussed about how the soul is the inner seer and the mind is the inner screen and on that screen various things keep popping up and distracting us so the process of yoga is the process by which the 
pop-ups on the inner screen stop popping up not only that the inner screen there is no agitation over there it is just one steady focus so the movements the material movements of the mind stop chitta vritti nirodha it's it's a steady perception in fact what happens is that inner screen which we had earlier discussed it's meant, it's meant to be a window to the outer world which can sometimes become a movie that starts showing us various things that inner screen becomes like a mirror and it reveals ourselves to us so we can see ourselves so yoga is meant for self realization and when we see ourselves we see ourselves in our in our full identity who are we we are spiritual beings we are souls and our full identity is that we are parts of a whole we are parts of a divine oh, and in that sense to understand ourselves is not just to understand aham brahmasmi as is a common spiritual saying that i am brahma yes that is true i am spirit i am not matter aham brahmasmi but the brahma the spirit is a part the, we are a finite spirit and we are part of the infinite spirit as krishna will explain later in the 15th chapter mamai vamsho jeeva loke jeeva bhutah sanatanah that mamai vamsho all living beings are my parts that is 157 in the gita so we we when the mind becomes like a mirror and we start seeing ourselves we understand ourselves and we understand our link with the divine with the whole the gita will reveal later that whole to be krishna and thus we understand ourselves in relationship with krishna so yoga is meant to help us establish that connection and establish a harmonization through self realization through purification so when on the inner screen various distracting things stop coming the impurities no longer come and the inner screen becomes calm and it starts functioning as a mirror then we understand ourselves and understand our connection with the divine so this inner inner illumination is the purpose of yoga yeah go ahead so the purpose of yoga as is as we discussed in the eight stages from pratyahara to samadhi is pratyahara is not feeding the senses so it's material disconnection we we disconnect ourselves from infatuation with the material level of reality and we establish a spiritual connection so establishing that spiritual connection and gaining self realization that is the purpose of yoga so now in this understanding of the purpose of yoga uh, where does the present uh, extensive practice of yoga in the western and westernized world fall most people practice yoga they do some postures for for become for becoming healthier looking becoming sl- slimmer and becoming fitter so where does this fall in so becoming healthier healthier slimmer fitter all these are these are physical these are benefits but they are fringe benefits of the process of yoga just as when we live in harmony then all aspects of our being are benefited by that so our our being has three aspects body mind and soul so physical well being is a uh, is a fringe result or fringe benefit of the practice of yoga and uh, of the by here the practice of yoga means by the practice of asanas when one starts feeling better that is a fringe benefit beyond that even the calming of the mind that results that is also a, a fringe benefit yes it's good to have a calm mind but what is the calm mind focused on that is important and <clears throat> the as our mind becomes purer then the various forces that are agitating the mind they leave the mind and therefore naturally calmness comes in but the essential benefit is spiritual joy that comes by establishing the spiritual connection with the divine 
Ananda. The soul is characterized by Ananda, joy. And that joy starts getting experienced when there is self-realization, when there is connection of our consciousness with spiritual reality. So that is the essential purpose of yoga, to experience that spiritual, to establish that spiritual connection and experience the spiritual joy. So the physical health is a, which is why most people pursue yoga, it is actually a fringe benefit. Please go ahead. So now if you consider what is yoga meant for, most people today practice it for health. And it is not just for health. Yoga has become a business and not just it's become a business, it has become such a business that often the original purpose is completely obscured and lost. There are many non-traditional forms of yoga that have come up which uh, involve people doing bodily postures but with no understanding of its spiritual side so one such example of yoga losing its purpose is the practice of what is called as doga doga is a portmanteau a com combination of dog plus yoga the idea is that Everything I want to do, I want to share it with my loved ones. And if my dog is my loved one, then I want to do yoga with my dog. So when somebody is practicing yoga with their, with their dog, that is called as doga. Now in this, what is happening? If there is any connection that is being established, it is not with any ultimate reality. It is with one's own dog. So this is... Yes, if one is lonely, one, ha one loves a pet dog, that is, that is one aspect of one's life. But if we practice yoga simply to reinforce our present conceptions and improve our, our material prospects, say if I am fitter and if I am slimmer, then I can attract better partners, then that is defeating the purpose of yoga. That is not only distracting one from the purpose, but defeating the purpose. So distracting is, we know this one purpose, but we go towards some other purpose because we get caught by that. But defeating means we go towards the opposite purpose. So if somebody uses, say for example, there are there is a whole genre called yoga for sex. So wherein the whole purpose of practicing yoga is so that one can enhance one's uh, sexual performance. Now this is, is not just distracting, it is defeating the purpose of yoga. Because yoga involves material disconnection, pratyahara. Pratyahara is disconnection from the physical level of reality so that one can ex experience uh, higher spiritual connections. So the, when, doing, when doing something material better becomes the purpose of yoga, then yoga then yoga is, that, that kind of yoga practice is defeating its purpose. In fact, for many people, yoga is not a spiritual practice. It is seen as simply a, a fat reducing practice. Now it's, it's good if one can reduce uh, fat uh, by non-intrusive means. One doesn't just uh, swallow, swallow pills or do other kinds of sometimes uh, arbitrary and dangerous uh, dietary uh, uh, practices which uh, which is uh, some pe so rather than that sometimes yoga asanas can be a health can be a more holistic way of losing weight and that is fine it's it's we discussed earlier the fringe benefit is also a benefit but when the fringe benefit is sought as the as the sole purpose, then the purpose is defeated. So yoga, now especially because uh, in today's world, uh, the one's looks are often considered very very important. They are always, but especially in today's times where society is very externally driven and relationships are short-lived and superficial, so the external looks matter and that uh, yoga has become a tool for that 
so therefore yoga has become a big business and millions and millions of dollars are are spent yoga industry goes into bill, much more than millions of dollars so this is a diversion from the per, diversion from the uh, original purpose of yoga can we go ahead so now if you understand the, the purpose of yoga we understand the purpose with which it is being propagated today it is being practiced today then how do we approach it now many of us we might have tried out some yoga asanas we might have benefited somewhat and we decided to continue it might have benefited but we felt it's it's uh, we don't really want to practice it or we might have just heard about it so when we start approaching yoga practice uh, what is the what is the way we can approach it in the most optimal way can you go ahead as the last part of our class now yeah so when we practice yoga for the purpose of practicing yoga that is when you for the purpose of developing a spiritual uh, connection uh, then we will get the get the physical and mental benefits also when we when we practice yoga for establishing a spiritual connection uh, for re realizing our spir core spirituality then physical health and uh, mental calm these will also come to us so we don't have to pursue these separately if we focus on the uh, ultimate purpose the more we live in harmony the the more we harmonize the greater is the joy that comes thereby and the physical and mental benefits also come can we go to the next slide now so in one sense we need to focus on life's ultimate purpose and that is also yoga's ultimate purpose what is that ultimate purpose our mind needs an unchanging object of love the soul needs an enduring loving connection uh, that's what we, we all long to love and be loved and we need that as a core need we need not just to love and be loved we need, want to love and be loved forever so the sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita which will talk about yoga will culminate in devotional meditation on the divine on krishna so by the whole practice of yoga one comes to the level of meditating on krishna that is our heart's innermost need and that is what yoga can ultimately fulfill that is ultimate's purpose that life's ultimate purpose which is also yoga's ultimate purpose so we focus on that now while focusing on that we we will get the, the fringe benefits as required so the, we will see later how the bhagavad gita recommends bhakti yoga as as the most accessible and most uh, as the most uh, transformational form of yoga and why that is we'll discuss but the bhagavad gita analyzes various forms of yoga and it does go deep into dhyan yoga for to some extent so the whole purpose is that if we understand spiritual connection is the primary thing there could be different yogas by which that spiritual connection can be established but the fringe benefits of yoga can come we don't pursue them primarily we pursue the spiritual connection can you go ahead so now what if one has started practicing yoga primarily for the physical benefits so then there can be two possible trajectories of that one is if it makes one open to spirituality then that's good that means we start practicing yoga and then we start we start feeling healthier we start feeling calmer and then you know hey what is this practice i want to know more about this maybe this practice is benefiting me this practice is maybe there is more that more it has to offer and if there is more to offer how can i how can i access that more how can i benefit from that more and by understanding that one starts exploring 
and this has happened to a significant number of uh, yoga practitioners that they do understand that yoga is a part of some eastern tradition it is a part of a spiritual tradition and they become more receptive to spirituality and they start exploring more then that is positive now on the other hand there can be a negative or uh, attitude towards yoga practice or negative result of yoga practice by yoga practice here i am referring to contemporary yoga practice which is primarily for the purpose of uh, of physical uh, benefits so if the two possibilities one may assume that i oh because i am doing these asanas that is my daily spirituality well if one starts thinking i have already become spiritual because i am practicing yoga well that may not be true we are we might be deluding ourselves we might be feeling a little better but the practice of spirituality is meant to not just make us feel better it is meant to spiritualize our consciousness to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level to help us appreciate spiritual reality if that is not happening then are we really practicing yoga no we are practicing some shade or shadow of yoga not yoga itself so <clears throat> of course some people might not even bother about spirituality i just uh, i do this i look better i feel better that's all and i don't care for it so then they themselves know that they are not doing it for anything spiritual they're just doing it at the utilitarian level well as i said that might be better than intrusive ways of trying to maintain health or improve looks but then there is nothing spiritual about it so but if one has some spiritual conception if one start thinking that my yoga practice itself is my spirituality and one doesn't explore deeper then one we stay stuck at that level without rising upward so that could be negative that might that might that will deprive us of the higher benefits of yoga can we go ahead <clears throat> so what happens some people use yoga to stretch their bodies and some people use yoga to stretch the truth now what do i mean by stretch the truth in stretching the bodies we understand uh, that is uh, what yogic exercises are yoga asanas are but there are many people who who may fancy themselves as yoga teachers but they don't actually teach the purpose of yoga so so they stretch the truth now stretching the truth is a phrase which means we 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 speak the truth so partially as to actually misrepresent the truth as to we don't uh, speak a outright lie but <coughs> we speak if say some we uh, we speak in such a way that it misrepresents say if somebody went to a, a party and they were bored they were miserable the party was uh, not at all enjoyable <coughs> and then so but there was one particular incident where everybody laughed in the party okay. and you come back and say oh the party was delightful well really one moment was delightful now the party was delightful and one moment is delightful so we take one moment is delightful and say the party was delightful that is quite a stretch so stretching the truth means so if we say yoga if some those who teach that yoga is to be done for health benefits then they are stretching the truth and uh, now of course uh, that is a distortion or a diversion from the purpose of yoga so rather than using yoga to stretch the body or to stretch the truth yoga is meant for some stretching something else that's the last slide of today can we go to the last slide that is use yoga to stretch your consciousness stretch your consciousness means our consciousness is currently caught at the material level where we perceive only material realities and yoga uh, is meant to stretch our consciousness beyond the physical beyond the mental to the spiritual level so we don't reject material reality but we don't restrict our consciousness to material reality 
we are aware of the material but our awareness expands beyond the material so yoga is meant to stretch our consciousness to take in the full truth the full reality we don't stretch the truth we stretch ourselves to take in the full truth and what is that full truth we understand who we are what we are meant to do our life is meant for spiritual exploration for spiritual realization and what joy can be ours to take in that full truth we are all seeking joy and at the physical sensual level there is some joy available through pandering to the senses at the mental level there is some joy available by just feeling calm or feeling serene that's good at the spiritual level there is eternal ecstasy available by by connection with an absorption in the ultimate reality that is the ultimate purpose of yoga and that is what yoga is meant to provide us if we stretch our consciousness so that we can take in the ultimate reality take in krishna as he is manifested transcendentally beyond this world at the spiritual level as he is manifested materially at the physical level in the world through his various manifestations then we we start experiencing the richness of life the sublimity of the joy that is ours as spiritual beings who are parts of the all joyful whole that is the ultimate purpose and fulfillment of yoga so i'll summarize what we spoke today and then we can have some questions i spoke today on the topic of um, three parts what is yoga well what is uh, uh, what is its how is it to be understood or what is its purpose and how is it being practiced today uh, and how we can utilize current practice to uh, fulfill its purpose so yoga is often equated with asanas but asanas or postures are one limb of one type of yoga we discussed the four types of yoga uh, karma karma yoga dhyan yoga gyan yoga and bhakti yoga they they utilize all of them utilize our entire being but each of them focuses on one being karma yoga focuses on the utilizing the body gyan yoga the intelligence dhyan yoga the mind and bhakti yoga the heart the essence of who we are this then we discussed about in karma in dhyan yoga there are eight limbs and uh, asana is one of those limbs three of its later limbs are all centered on inner on meditation so now so that's how focusing the mind is central to this yoga and then what is yoga itself yoga is meant for the uh, for establishing a connection yogam atma vishuddha yoga etymologically literally means connection the purpose of yoga is to purify ourselves so that we can connect with who we are and whose we are so the inner screen of the mind when we practice yoga steadily it becomes like a it calms down stops having any pop ups and it starts uh, becoming like a mirror and shows us who we are and gives us sublime joy and today's practice of yoga often leads us to divergence it it if we focus only on physical ben- health benefits yes that's fine it's a non intrusive way of maintaining health or fitness or slimness but if that becomes our sole purpose then we are diverting ourselves yoga has become a business and if it is leading us to just reinforce our material connections with others and seek better sensual pleasures or worldly pleasures then it is a diversion so yoga is a diversion and then then we talk about how the present practice of yoga can be can affect our spirituality if the peace that we experience the uh, the physical and mental well being that we experience inspires us to explore the yoga tradition more then that makes that is positive but if it makes us presume that we are already spiritual and we don't need to do anything more then we are depriving ourselves of the full benefits of yoga and the ultimate purpose of yoga is to establish a connection with the indwelling divine which is krishna and which is and when we practice yoga at our level 
if we focus on the ultimate purpose uh, of fulfilling our hearts longing to love and be loved then we can get the fringe benefits also but we won't be diverted by those benefits so thank you very much hare krishna so we'll look at the questions quickly one by one so why is dhyan yoga mm. is it okay to practice yoga for physical wealth or calming the mind to help us progress spiritually as devotees yes <clears throat> there is the principle of yukta vairagya as a part of bhakti yukta vairagya means that there is yukta is connection with detachment connection with renunciation so there is vairagya is renunciation so we engage without becoming attached so if we can use material things just like right now we are using uh, a phone or a laptop or we are using zoom so these are all material products of material technology if the products of material technology can be used for establishing a spiritual connection then what's wrong with us using the aspects of spiritual tradition for furthering our spiritual growth so yes if we uh, if yoga practices can help us to uh, promote our physical health feel a sense of physical stability which also leads to some amount of mental stability then that is good but if this practice starts uh, dominating our spiritual practice our time for spiritual practices and we start overlooking our devotional practices or our core spiritual practices and that is counterproductive so yoga practice is compatible with uh, with bhakti practice now some aspects of yoga yoga conceptions as they are practiced today they may not be they may not be compatible and if we don't get diverted that way then that is good now why is ashtang yoga referred to by the seventh limb of dhyan rather than its eighth limb of samadhi that's a see dhyan the word dhyan has um, a technical meaning as well as a general meaning and just like we have discussed this point of words having different meanings earlier like the word energy itself can have a technical meaning that is if a scientist says that what if i have lost my uh, i have no energy if they say in a lab that's a technical meaning i mean you are run out of electricity or battery or whatever but if they say oh come back home and i have no energy to the children who want to play with them that means they don't have physical energy so like that the word dhyana has a technical meaning which refers to one stage in the process of yoga but dhyan has a generic meaning also dhyana means focus absorption so and that focus or absorption is the essential driving uh, principle through the which takes a propels us forward through the various stages of yoga during asana also one is trying to do some dhyana one is trying to calm and focus oneself during during uh, yeah pranayam also one is trying to do dhyana but that is not on the spiritual reality often that is simply on the breath so so we could say that dhyana or meditation is the is the driving principle which takes us through various limbs of yoga and in that sense dhyana yoga in dhyana refers not so much to the technical stage of dhyana but it refers to the process of meditation which takes us forward in the practice of yoga now what is kundalini yoga is it recommended for a devotee to increase the concentration <clears throat> kundalini is a technical concept and i will not go too much into that at this stage but a quick explanation that <clears throat> at the subtle level there is the physical level there is the mental level there is the spiritual level now the subtle level which is the mental level it is analyzed differently by some different traditions then
then within that there are many subtle forces for example there is uh, there is as i discussed prana prana is not just uh, the uh, oxygen that we breathe in it is a life air and uh, it's subtle there is there's a description of different airs flowing through the body in different directions and that that is regulated through breathing so like that there is a subtle energy uh, within the yogic model of the self and that energy is called as kundalini and when that energy is activated uh, one can have different kinds of experiences it can make one very powerful if that kundalini is activated powerful in the sense of somebody might get some yogic powers but if that energy is activated in a, in an improper disharmonious way then that can have some serious uh, counter effects or counterproductive effects also so one has to be very careful in tapping the kundalini so uh, that's why that is that is to be if at all that has to be done it has to be done very carefully under uh, proper guidance however the power of kundalini itself is not necessarily a spiritual power it can be an extraordinary power in the sense that uh, people are not ordinary people don't have that power it's extraordinary but that doesn't mean it is spiritual it is subtle and it can very easily divert one from spirituality in when we are going to discuss about spiritual experiences and spiritual visions we'll talk about uh, mysticism and how mysticism is different from spiritual is not always spiritual so it can by giving us subtle powers and even if it doesn't directly have any counterproductive effects but it can distract the, the having those subtle powers can be can be intoxicating and can distract us that's why on the spiritual path a devotee on the bhakti path or on the path where one is seeking serious spiritual growth we don't get uh, too caught in trying to awaken the kundalini or go in that direction of uh, harnessing those subtle powers we want to activate our spiritual power not the uh, many subtle powers that we have so uh, how does practice of pranayam and yoga help in concentration on the holy name as a time of chanting maha mantra if it does can we do it for 5 minutes before chanting well yes the point here again is that each of us has to see what is the effect of particular practice on us if a practice uplifts us benefits us then we can do it now how might it help us we will talk about a comparison between bhakti yoga and dhyan yoga later uh more in more detail but at this stage so when our consciousness is caught at the physical or mental levels then when we experience some relief at the physical or mental level that is much more easily experienceable for us uh, we don't experience the higher uh benefits that easily so for example uh say if somebody is working at a particular job and they get a promotion and by that promotion they are getting bigger responsibilities they are getting more learning opportunities they are getting more influencing opportunities and of course they get a bigger raise now if they are if they are very much needing money at that time then the the primary thing that they will think about when they get the promotion is oh i've got more money well actually speaking from the point of view of the career trajectory the promotion gives them far more benefits than simply more money but if that's where their consciousness is they will evaluate it primarily in that terms only so similarly for us because our consciousness is at the physical or mental levels so that's why uh, we experience the benefits of yoga primarily at that level first now bhakti yoga gives us much bigger benefits but because our because our consciousness is not so spiritual receptive so uh, so in the practice of bhakti yoga we might experience some benefits of calming our mind by the practice of uh, of yoga asanas or pranayam and if it is that is okay 
um, so the yes so yoga can be a life tool and if you use it constructively then it is beneficial so now there are several questions I'll take some of them <clears throat> does the soul's health contribute to physical health yes it contributes in the sense that if we focus on seeking spiritual happiness then we don't crave for physical happiness in unhealthy ways if we are spiritually satisfied we won't say overeat we won't overindulge in our senses and overeating overindulging in our senses is often the cause of physical physical maladies so just by being in spiritual connection we, we learn to better respect and use the body without just caving in to the various physical cravings and that's how physical health is promoted now the difference between the mental and the spiritual levels is a subtle question and uh, we will discuss that in the next session and also this question about uh, now Lord Shiva is Adi Yogi he's a god of yoga well that is perfectly fine we can seek his blessings and practice yoga if our purpose is bhakti yoga so we will talk about the various devatas and uh, that, that whole conception in a later chapter of the Gita so thank you very much for your attention and participation uh, thank you Hare Krishna